ran into one of the guys that's hunting back here. And it was surprising because he's an older guy. It's usually younger guys that get back to these uh, far spots. And you have hip waders on, and he didn't try to walk to the sides at all. Just right into the sun. <laughs> and John spotted a bedded down white tail. How big do you think it was, John? starting to do what we're doing and it's not just here it's like every public property across the country we're seeing an upswing and people knowing what they're doing it used to be that uh, when you'd come out here uh, like gun season there'd be a ton of people but they'd all be up in the woods and just be like a pumpkin patch and if I went out and sat on an island in the cattails I wouldn't be able to see orange for a mile around me even though I can see over all the cattails but now you're starting to see a lot more pressure and we just got to adjust to um, find where the deer go. They're still in the same type of areas, but some of the spots go bad and then the other ones pick up and then when the places that were getting pounded stop getting pounded, they pick back up and it just kind of shifts around. Uh, I hadn't uh, pre-scouted the path that we're taking before yesterday, because yesterday's group we took through there. I was kind of surprised by the lack of sign because usually that area is really ripped up. So there must not have been a lot of big bucks in there last year. I know there were a couple at the beginning of the season, but they must have got shot or pushed out or something. But uh, uh, it should be a fun time. Uh, it's really driven by questions. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or anything, any concerns, uh, bring them up. Uh, that usually brings up some really good discussions and stuff. We're going to look at some spots where uh, I've hunted over the years. Uh, we're going to look at the spots that I hunted recently on, on video. Um, we're also going to look at an island where I've had... Uh, many run-ins with uh, big bucks uh, over the years. I shot my albino doe there too. Um, and we're going to look at how you can speed scout a big area. How many of you guys uh, looked at the maps of the area? So it would be fun to see uh, what you guys thought you'd scout based on what I'd scout. This marsh is uh, 2,300 acres. Um, if I was coming in here blind, I think I could scout this in a weekend. I think most people waste their time scouting too much uh, dead zone you know I think you can read a marsh like this pretty quick and get right onto the big bucks pretty fast by following that transition line and we're gonna do a little of that we're not gonna follow the whole transition line because I know where the dead zones are but we would follow it if we were actually scouting someplace where I've never been before so with that said we're gonna try and condense uh, vehicles a little bit because we're gonna move over to a small parking lot down the street and uh, Maybe if we can group up a little bit, we can fit everybody in there and uh, meet up over there. Sound good? actually going right through the parking lot and right through the trees here into that field where the uh, birds keep planting and eat the corn. There's a lot of corn spilled. And uh, I followed the tracks back. They all came over this hill and went into there. And from my guesstimation, I thought they'd be right behind that pine tree or they'd be up in them cedars over there. And I was dead on. They were right underneath that angle. Uh, willow tree that you can kind of see. That's where they were. Huh? Not, I would have guessed this was in that clump of down in there. Why, yeah. why did you say that tree? Um, um, right right because it's a big tree right on the edge of the cattails. So that's going to put a little high ground out there in that wet stuff. Okay. 
so they're looking to be a little isolated into the water. And, and like you said, most people would think they're back up into this brush. And sometimes you see the does and stuff in there, and sometimes you'll jump deer right down in here, like where I set up. But it's not going to be the mature animals, right? Yeah, that makes sense because this is that's west, I think. I just right. Checked. Correct. So yeah. the wind's going to blow that way. So if those are here, like the this. bucks are going to be all over there. In this case, pretty much everything is back there. Okay. Because of pressure or whatever. Oh. Sure. Okay. Um, but what we do see fawns and some does out here occasionally, you know. So on that video, they, they came looping around this way. They came from that tree around the corner, okay, right through that brush, there. right up to me. Right. We're kind of we're gonna go in there. We're gonna walk their path back. So we'll look at some of this. And, and one thing I want to portray here is you saw the trail come in here, right? A lot of people hunt here. But what do they do is they park where we hunt. And they think they gotta hunt the big woods over here. So they take that trail straight to the woods. And if you follow this up, you find out really quick that even though there's still some good bedding terrain, you get about halfway up this trail, you start getting close to the human trail. And your activity pretty much stops. Now you'll still see a lot of sign in that woods because they go to the feed on the old acorns and stuff like that, but they do it at night. So the majority of people that hunt these hardly ever shoot deer. I mean, I run into people out here all the time and they hardly see deer, they hardly kill deer. There's a small percentage of people that kill deer and they kill most of the deer that get killed. Because you either, you either know what you're doing or you don't. Um, most people hunt like they do on TV. They go out in the woods and they set up on an old flat with some rubs and stuff. And rubs are cool, but they need to be where they need to be um, in order for it to be daylight activity, right? So when you, like, have this property pretty well down there, when you go to another swamp, the deer are going to behave the same there? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I travel all over the place. I, I hunted probably nine counties this year in Wisconsin, and I hunted in Michigan. So I travel a lot, I, and I love, me personally, going to new places and figuring them out. That's my thing. Um, but this is my backyard, so I end up here. It's the same thing. You got a level field of wet area, right? Yep. That edge. It's just the biggest difference is you can look out over a marsh and you can see the points and fingers in the distance. But when you look out over the cedars, you, all you see is trees and it's confusing. But if you imagine all those, all those cedars or whatever you're looking at in that swamp as cattails, the surrounding edge is still what you want to look at. The islands are what you want to look at. So if you can get up high like this and you can see out over the cedars, you see some oak trees or whatever. Well, there's going to be a high spot there. There's going to be an island. There's going to be bed in there. You know. So it's really no different. And I go up north. It's the same thing in the big timber where there's no agriculture on the swamps and how I look at it, that transition edge. And I always get on to the better box right away by following that edge. So I can take a whole area like this that looks so immense and I can scout this in a day. I hunt up by Townsend for about a week every fall season and mm -hmm. there's all these little pockets like this in the big woods. And there's these big uh, like craters with all the swamp in them and I'm always drawn towards the swamp and I'm seeing more deer. Mm -hmm. Typically doing a little bit better than the rest of the guys. Yeah. Just because I'm hunting this kind of stuff, I totally agree with you. Yeah, the, the, the big thing I see around here is uh, people will look at me that know nothing about what we do, like I'm crazy going down in there. Um, I can think about where we parked in the parking lot, um, just over the hill there, in the cattails, right by the parking lot. Um, I've killed a lot of big bucks there. Um, there was a stretch of eight years in a row where opening day a gun, I killed a big buck in the same spot, doing a little drive. Uh, we'd wait till everybody's in the woods, and we pushed a little cattail stretch. And there's a little island out that they always bet it on, and I'd always kill my buck there. The guys were pushing. Uh, if there's no more questions, we'll go down and we'll walk that transition. We'll look at the bedding a little bit, and then we'll make our way out to that island and uh, and look at the primary <coughs> bedding. Any more questions? All right, let's head down. There. It probably looks like this is a cakewalk, but uh, I think Rick can uh, attest to this. And <laughs> so this is really probably uh, we're in like over your boots, like knee high water. I mean, you can stay atop your boots if you step on the humps, but as soon as you miss one, you're up to here yeah. with a leg. So this is pretty nasty stuff. 
and then it just tapers down into in the cattails it's water and muck and a lot of this is uh, 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 floating mat so it's really like a lake that something's grown over the top of so in certain places uh, when this is thawed when you walk on it's like walking on a water pit and the ground shifts around and it, and it scares a lot of people and I remembered what I was going to say about that last story so there was a we were down there shooting these bucks and one year we go down there to shoot one and there's a guy sitting on top of the hill which we didn't expect because it's right next to the parking lot he's an older fellow and he probably couldn't get around too much you know but he's looking down that hill and we go and drive it anyways and we're a little worried about him seeing what we're doing and telling somebody but we kill about a 140 inch buck and we got dragged up past him and I remember that guy looking and he goes you shoot that down in that water I wouldn't think a deer would be down in that water and he just goes on and on about why would a deer be down in that water? I can't even imagine you guys would want to drive the water. And we're soaked up to our armpits, you know, from going down in there, you know. So the next year we show up and that same guy is sitting there, well, probably because he saw a big buck get shot there, you know. So we go and we do the push again and shoot another big buck and have to pull it past this guy. And he's like, damn, two years in a row? I can't believe them bucks are down in that crap. We never seen him again after that, but... So he knew, but he wasn't willing to go down in. <laughs> right, but that's the common thing you run into. People don't Somewhere believe they're in the water. They think they're up on the hills and in the woods, but they literally couldn't be living in that woods over there because there's a guy in orange every 50 feet during gun season. It's like a pumpkin patch, and you wonder why somebody would sit in the middle of that. How would a deer ever get to him? It would never make it to him. I mean, use a little common sense. But I think, I think most of those guys pre-scout, find a spot, and they don't expect all those people, and the next year they're probably someplace else. It's probably different people. But you, you just don't see people going down into the water and muck, but that's where the deer are hiding, and that's where they're moving in daylight. So even during gun season, I get good movement. You know, but it's a short movement. I mean, look at, that's the tree that those deer were bedding under. Look how close I was hunting, and you're shooting those deer at the edge of darkness. You know? Right. So you got to get inside that window. And to do that, we're going to follow this transition, look at the bedding, and look at how close the setups are. So when I looked on this transition, I'm looking for stuff like that. The willow tree out by itself. Mm -hmm. Look like tail. there's anything going to happen there because it was all solid cattails with no <coughs> trails. But we get here, there's a heavy trail, and it circles around into a bed under that tree. When we came in here yesterday, we saw a couple of beds out here where they couldn't bed during the season. But they're still bedding, they're remembering their same bedding area type place. They're just bedding on the ice out here. And there is a good bed up right underneath the tree. Um, you can see how the deer were in here coming out of the beds and stopping and feeding on the dogwood. You can see where they're nibbling on it and all their tracks in here. You know they're getting snowed in a little now. Um, but I just wanted to show you, you can just go down here and it's one spot after another. And when you come down here, you're going to look at all these beds along this uh, transition. I guarantee you, you're going to walk through the beds of the buck you're after. He's bedding along here somewhere. So what you have to do is then start eliminating some of the bedding areas and saying, well, where do you think he would be? And for me, there's a small percentage of them where nobody goes, the spot by the road, okay? Um, an isolated spot, deep. Usually the general middle stuff is the stuff that gets hunted the heaviest. You know what I'm saying? But the stuff by the road gets forgotten and they get the people don't want to go through water and stuff to get the remote stuff. So if we're going to keep doing this, we just keep going down this path and we keep looking at this stuff. Um, but you're going to see the same stuff repetitively, but what you would see is some bedding areas look better than others. I mean, you might have good rub lines coming out of some of them and stuff too. And that can be a trick too, that can kind of fool you because timing has a lot to do with sign. So there's one bedding area back here that unfortunately I don't think anything big was rutting, bedding in there this last rut because there's not a lot of rub sign this year but the past few years it's just been tore up but the only time we see their bucks there is rut but them beds are just tore up with huge rubs so a guy would think well this is a hot spot i'm gonna hunt here all the time but the the rubs are there because of the timing of when the bucks are there they're there during the rut and that's when they rub the most so some of these bedding areas that kill big bucks aren't really rubbed all that heavy so you know sometimes you got to experiment around a little bit and hunt them a little you know, to find out what's in there, or throw a camera there for a season, get some intel. Another thing about these bedding areas is the timing. Some of them are used in early season, some of them late season, some of them run. So you really have to start to learn 
when do bucks are using those bedding areas. Sometimes it's obvious because of a food source, like an acorn flat, um, a corn field when the corn's in, you know, things like that. Sometimes it's not so obvious. You just have to throw some hunts at it. My rule is like if I really like a bedding area and I think something's probably coming out of here, it's just a matter of when, I throw a hunt at it early season, rut, and late season. And then even if I don't see a deer, I get a feel for when the sign was the best just by being in there close and, and hunting, right? Private land. But really, they hunt that private land harder than they hunt the public. Well, they think they got it made because they got some private land. So they don't realize that they've got 10 guys per, <laughs> <laughs> per 40, you know. I wish I'd tell. And, that, and that's something that uh, he just brought up that's a really good point. Is uh, You know, trying to figure out the deer can sometimes be hard for people. But you figure out people. I mean, you can think like people and think, well, where are they hunting and why are they hunting where they're at? And scratch that all off your list. You hunt like everybody else, you're going to kill like everybody else. So, if you, ju you just got to think about, like, if you were a deer and you're out here hiding and, and you had the mental capabilities that you have, where would you hide? And most of the time, you end up by using that mindset into the spots where these bucks are hiding. I mean, you think about it, nobody goes along the road in between the parking lots. I mean, that's it's great logic. You know, it's just... Uh, Look at the paths these people take. It's predictable. It's highly predictable. And uh, you can find the big bucks by doing that. They're just where people don't go. They can smell where a person's been for, I'd say, probably close to a month. And they're going where they don't smell people. People are so eye-oriented. They go where they, you know, they think what they see, you know. But deer use their nose. Their nose is more important than their eyes. You could probably poke a deer's eyes out and live just fine. But if you took away his nose, he'd perish. But this place has gotten a lot of pressure this this year from other hunters that moved in. And they're over pressuring and pretty much pushing the deer out. There's not as much sign as there used to be. But it's still a really good area, which is what drew those hunters into here. So the, the big draw to the deer is probably the isolation. Um, the best I do on this island is when these acorns are dropping on these oak trees. The flats on the outside get hunted quite a bit, but the isolated ones here don't. And um, I, I can't remember an early season where I didn't come out here and have a ton of deer go past me. First time to sit here. So you guys got any more questions or do you want to move over and look at that bedding? Or? How big is this island that we're on? This is probably... Ah, Five, six acres. Yeah. So is this a one hunt done for you? Or Pretty much. Maybe twice in a season, but it's pretty spread out. Like first of September and then way yeah. late. And so how do you choose that one hunt? Well, I like this when the acorns are dropping, but that's about every other year. Um, so if we have a good acorn year, I like to be out here right in that first week. Um, otherwise, I like to be out here right after, uh, like a week after pheasant hunt. Right when the pressure from the outskirts pushes everything into here, into the middle of the swamp. If you look at they come in the middle of the swamp, where are they gonna go? That's all underwater. So they have to have some place to go. So if the whole edge is getting hit hard, they're naturally gonna move to here. So from that pheasant side though, they're getting pushed out of CRP and whatnot, right? Generally more so. They're, well it's not too wet where the pheasants Well guys are. get guys get along the edge quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but you do see for whatever reason. You see a lot of deer get into here right after that. Um, to build off uh, his question, um, you're talking about the acorns maybe every other year. Mm -hmm. How do you know that they're good? Do you just come in expecting to hunt it and then see in the acorns? Because otherwise you're going to potentially it's a, it's a regional thing, and you can check the acorns on the outskirts to see if they're dropping. So if you got acorns out by the road or in your yard, yeah. they're dropping here. Got it. Yeah, every now and then you get a mediocre year where they're kind of dropping. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, they're either dropping everywhere or they're dropping nowhere. The tree I normally hunt out of, because um, of the slant of it, I usually face the tree stand backwards this way, and I sit on it backwards. It's probably better for one of you saddle guys. Um, 
That that six pointer I filmed the early season, that came out right here. This is where it was walking on that video. Um, I killed my albino doe out of that tree. Uh, several bucks. We actually used to hunt out of that oak tree a little too. But uh, this is where I would be. And if you look out here, this is where it tapers down in, right? And you start going into the ash and stuff. If you start looking a little to the left, you start seeing bushes out in the cattails. Those are those high spots that are isolated by water. That's where the bedding will be, it's back in there. So occasionally, especially late season when it would freeze up, we'd start to see the bucks bedding over in this, this edge stuff, which would make it a little more difficult. But primarily, they'd get up right underneath those bushes. And in a lot of cases, I'd actually be able to see them get up in the tree because it's a little higher. You see the antlers come up, and you know they're coming. But sometimes, too, when, when it's acorn, they go the other way and go to the other island and feed over there and then you see them cross the canal. But this has always been a primary bedding area that holds bucks year round. But again, there's peaks. Like when the acorns are dropping, this is really a, a hot spot. Any questions about the setup? Or? Um, did you, uh, sorry if I missed it, did you, did you say there's a particular wind that they're usually here or? Uh, no. Or not really. Not or really. Is there a particular wind that, that you'll hunt it? Obviously not the wind that's I just don't want the wind right blowing to them. I just don't want it blowing okay. to them. You'll hunt anywhere but yeah, the north. Exactly. Yep. There, there, here, yep. just anywhere. Yeah, I'm yeah. I think the center is probably in here. That's more time, but even for him to have the pressure to do that up here. Yeah. So you're even closer than that's, uh, I, I, I thought I was yeah, yeah, looking about earlier. I was have to show you some you know, I'm kind of picking up the other things we're seeing, but I'm getting too close to the bike when I'm setting up. Turning See, I keep thinking I am, but I'm still 20, 30 yards farther than he is. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm cutting the distance. the camera? Take a picture of him. That's with an iPhone. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you don't have to blend in with all the rub pictures on my phone. <laughs> oh, where was that? Was that another one? You gotta be able to see the height, right? <laughs> <laughs> big old rub. Oh, yeah. And see, now what you should have did is brought your bee stick with you and smile. <laughs> <laughs> so, all these little, uh, these little holes in here underneath these bushes are the beds. And the trails we walked in are the main trails coming out of here. And literally, when I'm in them trees, a lot of times I can see the bucks get up and move around in here from over there because they're so much higher than the water because there's like high spots here. You just pretty much see antlers and ears originally. Yeah, and sometimes I don't even see them. You but, just see uh, the cattails doing something against the wind or something? Yeah. Like in a corn. You, you just get a glimpse if yeah. you're looking at the right time, yeah. basically. Um, just to kind of show the pressure here, I thought we should all just uh, take the time to walk under that cell camera up there and give the guy a good picture. <laughs> Do we have to wait 30 seconds at a time? Oh. <laughs> she was a girl. So he can, uh, we got to get a great shot. shot. You really should get a great shot. Everyone's going to piss right there. <laughs> yeah, well, this should have been the yeah. best spot. That's been out here all season. I've seen it earlier. I made sure everybody posed for it yesterday. Kind of a quick question, but you know, we're here now and we're seeing you know kind of the signs like as we first walked in, you know, you point out the bed, but as it thawed, you'd see it be an actual bed. Mm -hmm. So would you? I mean, is it kind of? I mean, not a waste of time, but would it be better to wait till it starts to thaw to go? Depends on if you can read it. Yeah, so I can read it. I mean, you if, if you it. physically need to see the bed, you might want to wait a little longer because it'll be easier for you to read. Yeah, so like, I mean, I've been doing this for a lot of years, and uh, I got that down pretty good. Right. But you could do it now. And I mean, obviously, out there on that, uh, you see, we see when the, the snow, the snow melts and the ice melts, you'll actually be able to see the deer tracks and trails real, real easy too. Yeah. So it is way better um, visually after it thaws. But where it is hard is you're going to keep breaking through to your right. waist. Scouting, so it's a catch twenty-two. So it'd be, a, it'd be decent to get out and just kind of get a 
you know, lay of the land, look at it when you can And move, then come back. Then come back. And then you can come back and just look at the stuff you need to re-look at. Re look at re yeah. Is this all bedding that we just came through? Like they're bedding under these trees all the way through here? Not very often, but occasionally we'll kick deer off of this dike when we will up it. Um, not, not since the pressure picked up. But usually if there's no pressure, we walk up there and kick one off of it or two. Mainly just a travel corridor, though. Mainly, yeah. Mainly they like to be isolated by the water. They like those, uh, if you think about it like this, what a mature buck wants, which is different than a doe, a doe will bet on this dike like crazy, but what a mature buck wants is he wants to be in a spot where by himself he can protect himself and know if anything's getting in within that zone. I say what they got is like, uh, they got a bedding spot and then they got a safe zone. And from that bedding area, they think they know everything that's going on around them. Nothing can get in there. So if you look at this, I mean, somebody could come up this trail quietly and get right on top of it. A mature buck wouldn't put himself in that position. Say a coyote ran up here with his soft feet, real quiet, he'd get right on top of him. What a coyote can't do is get through that water over to that bed that's on that little hump by that tree, right? You'd hear him coming for a mile. So you get into the hill country, they use a lot of their scent and vision and stuff. And here they use a lot of sound, you know, in the thicker cover. Uh, and they hear you coming. And they try to isolate themselves by water or some sort of isolation and feel like nothing can get within that zone. And they've got a plan to bail regardless of where it comes from. Right. And there's always got to be a good escape. That's a good point. Because you see a lot of these spots where, you know, it looks like a great spot for bedding going out into a lake. You go out there and, man, it's got all the features. There's just no beds here. Why? Because you went down the channel. Where's the deer going to go? Jump in the lake and swim away? <laughs> they got to have an escape. And they don't want to escape neither across an open field. A good escape with cover is what you're looking for. So, so the escape in that other spot was across to kind of that other island that was Yeah, they just go through that nasty stuff through the canal and across. Okay. And I've seen them do it. I mean, they, they catch you going up a tree or something. I try to push it too close, see so if you can get up and go the other way. Okay. The canal won't stop them huge river that's real wide or a lake or a yeah. channel that'll stop them they don't want to cross that stuff but they'll cross a little canal like that like nothing uh, the reason I stopped here is I just wanted to look at this from this point of view right here you see these trees come up close to us and then you see that point of trees go out there and in between you see those trees in the cat tail there's a hole there into the woods and every place we have those bowls as a feature on a swamp or a marsh, there's always some higher ground and stuff in there that creates bedding. And it also has sort of a wind channel. So everything around there kind of swirls. And they bed there a lot. So we've killed a lot of deer out of this too. So they bed underneath those trees. And it's more of the same kind of bedding we just looked at. Just a lot of it. So there's a lot of bedding in there. And there's does mixed with the bucks. And We've killed and seen a lot of deer come in and out of that. And it's because of that feature where it goes around like that. So when the wind comes, it'll come, it'll swirl in there and you'll get this swirl effect. So you gotta set back a little bit from the edge, kinda, if that makes sense. So we'll go over there and we'll look at that and we'll tell some stories about what's happened over the years hunting that. And then when we look this way, you can look along this terrain and it's a little harder to see, but over in there you see those dead trees? Kind of taper down into the swamp. That's that dead ash again. Because now once you get to that water, and it tapers down, again, it's going to be good bedding. So what you're going to when you look at this, what you really don't care to see is like right here where it's just timber meets cattails, and there's no land feature there. That's probably not where you're going to find bedding. There's going to be some sort of feature there that turns the terrain, or where trees taper down into the into the cattails. So I just thought that this is a good viewpoint to see what we're going to look at because when we get in there, it kind of you lose your perspective. You probably see it on your maps. So, by the way, did, uh, any of you guys picking out any of these spots when you're looking on the maps? Yeah, that one back there. Yeah. I think we're making our way that way. I kind of put us coming in from the main parking lot, mm -hmm. and I never got around to this far. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just looking at it, going, "Well, maybe I'm not wrong. We're kind of heading that way." <laughs> this spot here is. I, I created this many years ago. I busted a trail from there to here because it was the shortest distance of uh, to get to that island. Um, and since then, people have started using it. But that kind of surprises me because the water here 
is about this deep. Um, I can get in here with knee boots on, but I get wet. I get wet up to about my knees. I usually fill the boots up and empty them out when I get about here. But uh, you gotta walk onto the cattails on the edge of it. But this is really deep. I ran into one of the guys that's hunting back here. And it was surprising because he's an older guy. It's usually younger guys that get back to these uh, far spots. And you have hip waders on and he didn't try to walk to the sides at all. Just right into the sun. <laughs> So this is that bowl I was showing you guys back there. It comes in here like this. And it's got that point that comes off the other side. And you got that mix of the cattails and, and trees that uh, creates bedding, the little high spots in there. And there's beds all over the place and we could spend a day in there looking around. Um, and the deer come out from different directions. So this is one of those spots that somebody mentioned earlier, well do you hunt the same bedding area twice? Well, I can hunt over here and over there and it's like totally not impacting the other spot, right? So, uh, one thing I've noticed over here over the years is if I push that limit and I get right on the edge of the swamp here, in the evening, the water in that swamp gets warm and starts uh, having a thermal effect, especially in early season. It pulls your scent into there no matter what you have for a wind. So I tend to set up back further now, instead of back here where you have just whatever the wind is. And, uh, where I've had uh, action here is usually early season. We usually come out here like opening week sometime. Um, past few years, I don't think I've ever sat here and not had four or five deer go past. Um, last time I sat here was two seasons ago and I had two bucks and two does go past me on opening day. But I didn't shoot any of them. Um, last year I sat over on that point over there opening day and I had uh, five does go by but no bucks. But uh, We've had a lot of action with bucks in here. Um, especially over in that area over there. Um, there's usually a pretty good rub line that goes through here. It kind of shows you there wasn't any good bucks in here this year. But you can see the old uh, scarred trees. And those are important because uh, they show you the history and these bucks repeat themselves. And sometimes you come into an area like this and if there's old scarred trees and no fresh ones, well maybe it was the opposite year of acorn drop and maybe that's a good sign for the coming year and there's a bunch of fresh ones maybe the next year you're not gonna have acorns you're not gonna be better next to the acorns kind of thing you know but in a lot of cases they bed here for other reasons uh, one other time of the year that's good for this spot is rut because on the other side of this field is a real thick area that holds up the does quite well but the bucks don't bed in there it's dry land and it's pretty much too thick for them to get into but they come out of here and move their way over to them that area gets a lot of pressure from hunters just because it looks like a good deer area because people think this stuff's got to be really super thick. Um, and I don't see too many people over here on the edge of the swamp in these open oaks, but I see a lot of deer. Um, so this is the uh, entrance coming up from this side. If you noticed when we walked through the cattails, those lower cattails, and here they can kind of follow the cover back out. There's a couple big trees out here they bed under quite a bit, like the one straight out from here has a really good bed underneath it. And then the trees that you looked at over here, these clumps of trees, are some higher ground where they can be isolated in the water. And once again, there's deep water between us and those bucks. So you can see that this has been pretty active. This has a lot of rubs in it. And uh, if you notice, you can see rubs from the same year, this year, that go in different age classes. So you can see that bucks have been coming through here all year, all season. And this is the way they generally come into here. Um, and it's obvious. If it weren't for the rubs, you'd find trails, and you wouldn't find them until the snow is melted. But you'd, you'd see a pretty defined trail here if it weren't for the snow and ice. So we'll come on up onto so here, what and you follow you say, the rub line right in. What would you say the timeline differences between those rubs and the one right behind you? Uh, that's not this year. But you can look at this one. That's what I was looking at is that one. Here. That's obviously from early in the year, like in September or something. But that's more rut time where it's still got the orange in it. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that's just that an educated like, guess, but you can, yeah, that's a pretty fresh one there. And the one in front of it's new, but it looks older, right? Um, but you're seeing rubs that are dried out and rubs that are still kind of not too long ago, right? From November, probably. When, when you say the trees back there, you're talking about the further ones out there? Or are you talking one, like 20 yards or 75? 75. Okay. Not right on the point. No. Okay. 
isolated by the water once you get past the deeper cattails, right? Mm -hmm. If you stand where I'm standing right here, you can see the one I was pointing at, that real big one. The, the bigger tree? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. But it's out in the cattails? Yeah. I can just about guarantee you there'll be a, a big buck bed right underneath that tree, and it'll be every time you see something like that. It's isolated by water out there. This, this here is also water, isn't it? Under no, here. this is just kind of muck coming out of the water. The water's going to starts about uh, 15, 20 feet from us. Okay. So um, when we walked through that last batch, um, it was a little disappointing because of the lack of sign. Because I'd like to, you guys to have seen the rubs that were in there like last year or the year before because you get the point that, you know, you see that stuff and you want to just hunt there all the time. And really that was just rubs <coughs> that they're doing that. I wasn't seeing deer there early season. I wasn't seeing deer there late season. But every year rut, something kind of shows up there because it's adjacent to doe bedding. So a lot of times you'll find some, like a, a bed in there that's got some beds that they, they don't really look like they're that used. But there's rubs all around them and you'll want to hunt it. And you got to start using that uh, noggin and thinking about why is this bed not used and these rubs here instead of just focusing on the rubs. And if, if the bed's not used much, it's because he didn't bed there much, right? But if there's rubs everywhere, why would he be rubbing like that? So it's probably a rut time frame. Um, and I'm seeing that more and more. I really started picking up on that about five years ago. I started doing some observations of bucks coming out of those types of beds and backtracking deer to it. And it really started dawning on me. And now I've been paying a lot more attention on it and it's become really obvious that they have specific spots to bed during rut phases um, to monitor does and doe travel. So if you had to guesstimate, when would those pick up, like October something? Uh, probably about October 15th uh, to about the first week into November in, in this region. Um, another thing too, um, I mean look at that down there. I mean if you were looking close you probably saw some of the old scarring what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, but you probably also noticed, hey this is kind of like that dike over there, it's surrounded by water but it's long. and. He said they don't bet on this stuff. Well, that's probably why they ain't betting there all year. That's probably why it's just there during the rut, because it doesn't have all the features that they need all year. But I literally saw some really big bucks come out of there. There was, uh, during the CWD days, um, they used to have a gun season uh, that was in rut. And I was hunting on that point that we looked at first. And uh, I had a greenhorn hunting with me who was hunting behind me. And we said, you sit over there. It was gun season. You know, that little gun during the rut that we had done. And uh, he was kind of confused where to go. And he had just kind of gone over there. And I was looking out over the marsh, waiting for Mario and the guys to come pushing through there. And I hear him come walking up to me. And I turn around to bitch at him, and it's a big buck. <laughs> and he's standing at the base of my tree looking up at me like this. I, why he didn't shoot, he's standing there looking at it. And uh, I unloaded the gun on it and never hit it because I had to swing funny. And I felt like an idiot because it was 10 yards, but he's barreling through the brush. But it, it was fresh snow that day. We had a snowstorm come through, and it ran through here. And what was funny is after I shot it, I looked up, and there was a much bigger buck with it further back. And they had come out of that spot. That's why I still started looking at that spot that we just looked at. Um, the the smaller of the two ran through here, went through the stick stuff into there, and we put Dave on its track, and the rest of us went up and surrounded the hill. And Dave actually shot it in his bed over there. Um, it was funny because the antlers popped off as soon as it hit the ground. <laughs> it shed its antlers in uh, November. No. But uh, weird. You get that every now and then. I mean, we seem to shed a lot in December. This is that thick spot I was telling you about, where the does bed a lot, but you don't really get the bucks in there. This attracts a lot of hunters, especially on the other side of it, because they think they've got to look for that thick spot, and there'll be deer trails going in and out of here all over the place, and even rubs, because the does go in there and they bed in circles, and they're not as concerned about the waterways as the bucks are, because they bed as a group, watching danger. And uh, we've done pushes in there, and you'll push piles of does out of there. I've never seen a buck come out of there with any size to it. But you'll see rubs all over the edges of this. But this is the stuff that those deer were coming from rut, from that bowl to here to come into, to there. Why 
Why do you think that is? 